Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Hope everybody's doing well. Now, before I start with the show, you may have noticed something different. I'm by myself. Trevor's not here recording the show. So I wanted to make the announcement that I'm actually taking this show solo moving forward. Trevor and I have had some discussions about this for some time, and he's just really getting busy with the Model 3 Owners Club channel. And he wants to devote more time and effort to that. And of course, between the two of us with our busy work schedules as well in our lives, it's been, it's been challenging to find time to get together to actually record shows. So uh, Trevor wanted to dedicate more time to his show, and I wanted to, of course, continue moving forward with the EV Revolution show and the format that we've started. So I want to, of course, continue to wish Trevor all the best in the Model 3 Owners Club channel and hope that you will continue to tune in to myself and to this channel to follow me on my journey as I explore the EV world. And also I wanted to let you know, in case you're, you're not familiar, I've also released uh, and starting to do some audio podcasting. So this is something to kind of fill in some time between the shows, uh, bring in some different guests, talk about some various subjects in the EV world and so forth. So if you go to iTunes and you search for EV Revolution Show, you'll find the audio podcast information there and you can subscribe as well. It's also available on the audio podcast feeder site at www.evrevolutionshow.com and you can check that out. So I thank you for that and let's get right into today's show. Now, one of the things we get asked a lot about from people who are looking at EVs is, is the environmentally friendliness of them, I guess, if you want to say. And this is a reference, uh, an article that came out through Science Focus, and it's a report actually done through BBC World Service and Crowd Science. And it's a 2014 uh, EU study, but it's still uh, fairly relevant from that perspective. In fact, if anything, the data will be more ambitious towards the EV side. But it basically looks at, at green and the, the energy supply to both fossil fuels and electric uh, cars and how green those fuels are looking at uh, emissions basically uh, co2 emissions from those sources so really green energy of course depends on how that power is generated right whether it's through coal or whether it's through fossil fuels or through solar wind etc and you know the study found that even if power from the dirtiest coal-fired plants um, are, are produced, the electric cars actually still have a lower CO2 emissions overall because stations turn fuel into energy more efficiently actually than multiple small engines as in ICE vehicles. And um, these uh, power stations can filter the exhaust stacks from plants better in general than of course ICE cars can. So, um, so there is that data that supports that. And here's a graph behind me that talks about the emissions or that shows the emissions from various sources including propelling the car, uh, making and transporting the fuel, and generating the electricity where applicable. So as you can see that the battery electric vehicles by far have the lowest um, CO2 emission. So quite interesting article and something that you can share with people who, when you have those discussions or if you're, if you're curious about, uh, about some of these things that we've discussed, we'll do well on that kind of stuff as well. Now, another uh, question we get asked a lot about, I guess, is a cost. And uh, of course, I just put up my two-month review video for the Nissan Leaf and, and put up some estimated costing around uh, how much it's costing me to charge that car and for the mileage that I'm getting. And it was a surprisingly, it was a surprising exercise for me to go through because I really didn't think it was going to be that low, uh, even if I'm off a few cents a kilowatt. Um, but uh, here's a study that came out and it's a uh, article from cleantechnica.com website. And it talks about supercharging versus gas. So taking, of course, the infamous Tesla supercharging network and utilizing that to do long distance journeys. And of course, supercharging, because Teslas have the best long long range capabilities of, of EVs so far in any markets. I mean, the Bolt is pretty good as well. Um, but using electricity in this case as the cost for gas for your trips and comparing that to fuel. And this study uh, did a comparison of the Model 3, the X and the uh, S versus a 20 mile per gallon SUV. This is an American study, by the way, and a 50 mile per gallon hybrid. And they calculated the cost for fuel for a 1,000-mile journey or 1,600-kilometer road trip. And supercharging, they based the rates of, of around between $0.20 cents per kilowatt hour and $0.26 cents per kilowatt hour in the U.S. I won't get into how accurate that is. They looked at different states. And as you can see in the chart behind me, it breaks it down for some of the states that are there and, of course, um, the, the, the numbers that came out of that. And the surprising thing is that the actual the, the Toyota Prius, in this case, that they, that they used for their hybrid 
scored very well. It actually um, has a costing just less actually than even the Model 3. Um, and that's, I think, because of the efficiency of that hybrid model uh, versus, of course, um, pure electric from today's standards. Now, the drawback, of course, is that there is some emissions coming from the Prius. And, of course, we, we know that the SUV for the Chevy Tahoe is going to rank, is going to be the most expensive to do on a trip. But if you've got four kids and a dog and a bunch of stuff to carry, uh, sometimes that's what you're left with is uh, you have to use what you can. And that's one thing I, I, I tell people when they're thinking of EVs is what, what are your needs? Uh, what are your driving habits, range, and so forth? And if you need to carry a lot of stuff all the time and whatever, an EV may not be something that you can choose at this point in time. Staying on the topic of charging, ABB in the in Europe uh, has announced that they're going to donate 30 DC fast chargers to the city of Zurich in Switzerland. It's a gift to Switzerland's capital, which is pretty generous of them. And of course, uh, ABB happens to have their worldwide headquarters there, so that kind of helps. Uh, but they're going to donate 30 of these Terra 54 chargers. And these are 50 kilowatt chargers that have two connections, which is pretty standard now, CCS and Chatamo, of course. Um, and the city is working with ABB to uh, look at locations and who's going to operate those from a service provider perspective. That's great to see more chargers uh, being spread out in the world. And of course, we know that Europe is uh, very quick to uh, look at EV adoption. So congratulations on Zurich. Now, staying with the European theme, uh, Volkswagen headquartered in Europe, of course, is doing many things to uh, kind of change their reputation in the world, to say the least. And the Canadian company has announced that they're going to form or actually that they formed a company called Electrify Canada. And it's a new company that's going to build and manage an ultra fast DC uh, charging network. And I, I use ultra fast as a term there. They're going to uh, install 32 sites near major highways and metro areas in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario. I'm surprised why Quebec's not on that list, but I'm sure that that'll be uh, added later on. Each site will have four chargers. Again, there'll be dual CCS and Chatamo, and they'll be uh, 150 kilowatt to 350 kilowatt capable, and that's where the ultra fast comes in for the DC charging. Uh, of course, they'll be also uh, have the ability to deliver 50 kilowatt and for your standard cars. They do plan on having this out by the second quarter of 2019, so that's pretty aggressive. It's uh, only about a year away, basically, maybe just under a year. Let's see what happens there. Now, switching gears, let's talk about some of the uh, auto manufacturers. Uh, Tesla, of course, is always uh, at the top of our list. Um, vehicle production is continuing to climb. And uh, the, the one interesting part about this information is that Tesla is not only, of course, continuing production and increasing production with various vehicles, especially the Model 3, but they're actually climbing the ranks for vehicle production overall against North American um, factories and uh, the other automakers. And Bloomberg actually did a study and they looked at production rates uh, at the end of last quarter for Tesla and they, and they uh, confirmed that Tesla was able to achieve a total of 7,000 in a week. That's at one point, and this is a combined production, by the way, this is both mo uh, with Model 3, the S and the X combined. And that output actually ranks 48th among the 70 North American factories. And that's quite an achievement for a company that's only been building cars really in mass quantities in any uh, uh, form like that since about 2012, since the launch of the S. So that's quite an achievement for, for a young company. And of course, this graph uh, behind me shows uh, Tesla compared to Ford. Um, as far as how they're trending from that perspective, you can see they're not that far off of Ford's pace and similar to Toyota in this graph here, uh, where uh, Tesla is, is trending fairly well. So good on them. Congratulations, Tesla. And we hope that they, can, they are able to continue to sustain these productions and uh, continue to move forward. Now, also, I mentioned Model 3 production as being in that numbers, and uh, another article from Inside EVs commented about that the Model 3 production had exceeded 50,000 units now year to date, and that's as of July 17th of this year. It actually uh, hit 50,544. This is uh, according to tracking VINs and all kinds of different sources for tracking the numbers, and Inside EVs, as we as mentioned before, uh, have been very consistent in their numbers. They're, they're pretty, pretty darn accurate, so good on them to uh, have those numbers handy. Um, now, Bloomberg, of course, also predicts that the third quarter should see at least 50,000 more Model 3s uh, produced, if not uh, even more than that. And the current number of VINs registered through, I think, the VIN tracking websites ex has exceeded 75,000. And here's a couple of graphs that show Model 3 production doing that hockey stick um, of EV <laughs> 
uh, production and of course adoption that uh, I've been talking about for a long time. And of course, these sources are from Bloomberg and hopefully uh, they're uh, in informative to you. Now, a story that I spoke about a couple of shows ago, um, and, and in fact, covered a couple of shows on this, was about Tesla in Germany and some issues that were going on with the incentive program that the German government was running. And so um, this incentive program was pretty lucrative. It was about 4,000 euros. So, you know, in Canadian dollars, that's almost 8,000 and uh, U.S., probably 6,000, something like that. So it's pretty significant. And uh, apparently uh, these incentives were funded by both the German government and the automakers. So in this case, half was paid by the German government and the other half paid by the automaker, in this case, Tesla. And what happened is Tesla modified their pricing structure so that they could get some of the Model S's to eke in or squeak in under that threshold to be able to qualify for some incentives. Well, of course, Tesla was on and then now they're off again. They, they were officially taken off the approved list, I believe, uh, late last December, last November, excuse me. And now the German Federal Office of Economics and Export Control is asking some Tesla customers to pay back the government's portion. I'm really not sure why uh, the article didn't uh, didn't mention anything. And, and they're asking for 2,000 euros back from uh, about 800 owners uh, and canceling, of course, uh, they had something called the environmental bonus to 250 others that were previously ed eligible. And that, hmm, that sounds kind of similar to what we're going through in Ontario here, but that's another story. Um, so Tesla, of course, is appealing the decision. However, they're offering to cover the cost of the government's portion until the issue is resolved. That's mighty nice of them. That's big money when you're talking a couple of thousand from 800 owners. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what's going on in the German government, but uh, if you if you live there and you're following this, you may want to write to your local uh, parliamentary representative and wherever you live from a federal perspective and just comment uh, your uh, feedback on this situation, whether you think it's right or wrong and what the government should do to help. So let's hope something gets resolved there. Now, as a report came in from uh, Nissan that they've continued to shine in the EU because the Leaf is the number one electric car selling right now in the European Union. So numbers have come in for the first half of uh, 2018 that the Leaf is in the number one spot. They've sold more than 18,000 Leafs in uh, EU. That's the first time actually that they've been able to pass the Renault Zoe. And, and I've talked about this before. The Zoe is a fantastic car, sells very, very well. So let's wait and see if Nissan production capabilities uh, and whether they're able to actually do what they're predicting of about 40,000 Leaf sales by the end of the year. The, the numbers for tracking overall global sales for Leafs, they have uh, clipped the 340,000 mark for Leaf sales globally. And that's of course since 2010, since they deb debuted. So congratulations on Nissan. And let's hope they can continue to deliver. I want to briefly just bring up the Hyundai Kona again. Um, they've actually started selling and they've sold over 2,500 units in South Korea and in some other parts overseas. Now, EV sales are increasing for this manufacturer. They've actually combined uh, what they uh, lumped the both battery electric and, and, and uh um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles into one category, but that category for them has increased 137% sales year over year for them. So obviously it's getting their attention to be able to commit more product, more engineering, more design, so forth to these tech EV technologies. So I'll have to wait and see what uh, the Kona monthly production rate will be. There's no talk about that yet. And let's see if they can keep up with demand because that seems to be a trend right now of uh, supply and demand. But good on, on Hyundai to at least start to get some of these uh, vehicles out there. Now, we talked about Polestar a while ago, and, and I want to bring up the Polestar 2. Now, Polestar, if you're not familiar with that brand, it's Volvo's performance uh, division. Um, and they've announced that their upcoming all-electric Polestar 2 uh, here's a picture of it behind me, is to have a range of about 350 miles uh, or 563 kilometers. And that they claim the power output to be about 400 uh, horsepower uh, or even better than that. I don't have torque numbers there. Now, this is based on the 40.2 concept car that was uh, seen at uh, one of the auto shows earlier. And the estimated pricing for the Polestar 2 is going to be between 40 and 66,000 USD. Um, no, no comments about battery pack sizes or anything like this in this article that I picked up, but the estimated launch launch is supposed to be 2019. So let's uh, let's see what happens. It's not a uh, not a bad looking car if they stick with this design. Of course the uh, the SUV or crossover space is is really the hottest space right now for automobiles in general and they seem to be going after that. Now, in other news, uh, I talked at the last show about some mass transit and uh, some commercial 
applications for electric vehicles. And I want to continue on with that. It's, it's really nice stories to see this. And there's a lot of them coming out. But I, I picked a couple that I wanted to talk about today. Chinese manufacturer BYD has been awarded a um, supply contract for 42 articulated buses for the city of uh, for uh, in Norway, actually, excuse me, and these are for the city of Oslo. Uh, they're planning on delivering these in the second quarter of 2019 to Nobina, I believe is the uh, bus uh, company. And Nobina intends to replace their current fleet of diesel buses with EVs on on a lot of major routes in the Oslo area. So good luck to them on that. These are pretty cool looking buses and we are seeing uh, a lot more um, buses and mass transit applications, especially in trial basis with a lot of municipalities and uh, areas around the world. Uh, now, London in the UK, uh, they actually are working with BYD and ADL to deliver 37 double-decker electric buses. Uh, for that city. They're also going to be delivered in the second quarter of 2019 to Metro Line. Now these are a little bit different where they're going to be assembled in the UK by ADL. They're using BYD's uh, battery and powertrain technologies and engineering and ADL will provide the bodywork and the interiors for these buses. Um, they're kind of cool looking buses as you can see for the image uh, behind me. They are eye-catching styling and uh, they're going to use BYD's iron phosphate batteries which enable the buses to run all day on a single charge and that's kind of what you want from a mass transit. Uh, therefore they can really take advantage of uh, time of use or cost effective off-peak charging for these buses to lower their operating costs. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, the fleet will service Route 43 which is running uh, through the heart of the city of London and one of London's busiest routes. And uh, just as a fact, there's definitely more business there to be captured by electric bus manufacturers because uh, there's currently over 6,800 double-decker buses in London. So, of course, the market potential is high. And I mentioned earlier about uh, some of the models and the production timelines and, and uh, that supply uh, is not meeting up with demand at this case. And um, this is actually a challenge right now for many EV consumers who are actually on the market. I mean, we've been talking, I think, in the past, uh, certainly I've been talking about, you know, charging availability and, and the benefits that you can charge at home. And there's much more infrastructure now outside of the home and abroad. Of course, the lower costs of, of quote unquote fuel, which is the electricity, not gas, and, and of course, maintenance costs being lower. These are all big benefits to EV adoption. Well, obviously, this is working because people are, are getting attention now. That, uh, actually, consumers are looking to buy EVs. And with the tremendous growth in this sector, we're seeing more product, we're seeing more manufacturers get into the game. However, the challenge right now is availability and you know, delivery wait times for new orders are just getting longer and longer. So current uh, wait times right now, as of the show taping today, uh, for Tesla, the model new orders for the Model 3, I'm not sure what trims these are. Uh, these This is a report that came from cleantechnica.com, and uh, they linked it from evobsession.com. They don't uh, claim the trim levels, but certainly the Model 3, they're claiming that uh, September to November right now are uh, wait times or delivery times for the Model 3 on a new order. Uh, Model S is November and the Model X is November as well. So, um, you know, it's a few months that you have to wait for a car. There's not a lot sitting around in showrooms, obviously, from Tesla's perspective. Now, Chevrolet with the Bolt, uh, it's up to a year to get a, a Bolt. Uh, Chevy has claimed that they're starting to increase or that they have increased production. Uh, but I'm not seeing any any changes to delivery estimates at that point. And that, that uh, stays true here in Canada as well. I'm hearing next year for deliveries for the Bolt right now. So hopefully they can crank some more of those out. Nissan Leaf, which we talked about earlier, has over 35,000 orders placed. And demand is, is, of course, outstripping the sales worldwide. In some areas, they're sold out. I talked about uh, information that I heard that Nissan is pretty well sold out here in Canada for new orders and that they're taking orders now for 2019 uh, calendar year. Um, and Hyundai, I talked about the Ionic before, that demand is certainly exceeding production in, in all geographies that uh, I'm hearing, that there are six month plus wait times for the Ionic. Um, I believe that there's some battery shortage issues that are helping to fuel those wait times, but hopefully they can get things for, uh, sorted out. The VW eGolf, it's still in very limited production as VW looks to switch over into the ID platform and start uh, coming out with those cars in 2019, 2020, those vehicles. So they're not really anxious to build a lot, a whole lot of eGolfs. Uh, primarily, they're fo focusing on the EU market because that's their biggest market and getting deliveries there. There has been some very small numbers in North America, but it's, uh, again, 
saying production is limited, so don't hold your breath for anything in North America. And the Renault Zoe, I wanted to throw that in there, uh, but they've got a five to six month wait list in the UK and I believe about three to six months in the EU. So even they're struggling to keep up with demand and it's a great car, the Zoe. And uh, it, it's good to see the demand. I'm hoping that the new, all these manufacturers can kind of really gear up and start cranking out these cars to meet those demands and to get these uh, cars on the street. Uh, that's what's important. All right, so it's time to get into mailbag. Uh, what I'm trying to do on these shows is to keep them a little bit shorter and, and can provide more frequent shows to that. So I have a couple of uh, emails that came in over the last few weeks. Uh, one is from Thomas. Now, Thomas doesn't say where he's from, but he was just basically asking about the value of the Leaf versus a Model 3. And, you know, he's got some family and some friends that are talking about that, um, even when you look at the base Model 3. Um, yeah, I mean, when you look at pricing, the Model 3 certainly becomes very competitive against the Leaf. But well, first thing I want to say, and I won't, I won't talk a lot about this topic, but they are different cars, and they're 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 targeted at different markets, right? The Tesla is after that luxury midsize market. You know, they're going after the 3 Series BMW, the Audi A4, the C-Class Mercedes, and so forth. That's their target market. The Nissan Leaf is targeting the you know the the Chevrolet Cruises and the uh, Focuses and this kind of uh, the Elantras and these these sort of marketplaces, uh, so th they are going after a different demographic and a different uh, buyer uh, market. Now, obviously, the Model 3 standard range at 35,000 US becomes a more compelling argument when the, the Leaf is around 29 for the base model. And when you compare features, um, you know, the Model 3 obviously gives you a lot more features from a range perspective, from an active uh, thermal management perspective, from uh, over the air updates and continuing evolving and improvements to the vehicle over time. And of course, access to Tesla supercharger network, which is all the last two being very proprietary. And the Leaf gives you more affordability. Uh, it gives you a lot of features when you up it to the SL trim. Even the, e and the even the midline trim gives you a lot of features for the for the dollar there, uh, which you would have to pay extra for on the Model Three, and that starts driving the price up. So it's a it's a hard. Um, topic to actually talk about and to give a, a definitive winner for each one everybody you know people watching the show are going to have their own opinions but they are targeted at different markets for different use cases um, so it really depends on budget it depends on driving habits and range uh, access to charging networks and, and all these other elements you know climate and things like that as well which one might be better suited for you and uh, that's that's what i would take back as far as information there and hopefully that's helpful and my second uh, question for mailbag uh, comes from Tobias from Germany. Thank you, Tobias, from this. Um, he basically asked, uh, what, do you, what do you think about the first European country uh, where we think the Model 3 might go on sale? Uh, so obviously, uh, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think really anybody knows for sure. Tesla keeps his information very tight-lipped. But um, I would guess if there's any EU country that's going to get the Model 3 first, it would be Norway. Norway's been leading of course, EV adoption for several years now. And of course, EV adoption from a Tesla perspective, um, there's a ton of Teslas out there. So that would be a good guess. Uh, maybe Germany might be second, even with their bit of a Tesla incentive war that seems to be going on. Uh, I think that country is ripe for, for Tesla to start uh, initial deliveries of the Model 3. It will do very well uh, against that uh, marketplace and, and those climates. And then other countries after that with, uh, you know, sticking with left-hand drive, uh, needed countries of course because right-hand drive will take a little longer uh, for the, for tesla to get the model threes out you know we're hearing obviously i think around mid of 2019 for time frames so that would be my guess from a country uh, that uh, may get it but uh, maybe somebody wants to start a pool for charity and we can all put some bets in and see what happens but uh, thank you very much for tobias for the question appreciate you sending me an email so that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Hope you like a little bit shorter format and a little bit bounce around on the topics just to give you a spattering of what's out there from the EV news perspective. Uh, certainly always love to get emails and uh, comments and questions, of course, sent to me. You can do that through evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter or communicate that way, you can reach out to me at evrevshow. It's a Twitter handle. Please, of course, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, basically, I've had to start this channel all over again. Um, so I'm not linked in any way to the Model 3 channel at this point uh, from a YouTube 
uh, analytics metrics uh, viewpoint as well. So um, every uh, sus subscriber uh, means a lot to me. I'm hoping to grow this channel um, so that it can get better credibility, of course, and it gives me more access to uh, manufacturers and vehicles and stories that I want to follow in the future. So I would appreciate if you did subscribe to the channel. And as I mentioned, the, the new audio podcast that I've launched, I just put up episode two yesterday. So please check that out. It was a great episode um, with some special guests that I had there. So please have a listen in on that. And lastly, I just want to remind viewers that I have started a separate Patreon campaign for this channel dedicated for the EV Revolution show. You can go to www.patreon.com backs forward slash ev revolution show and you can contribute there anything would be much appreciated um, patreon revenues from the model 3 uh, channel are 100% uh, going to trevor at this point since i'm not affiliated with that channel anymore so uh, i'm starting all over again with that folks so i would appreciate anything that you could to you could to help me with through patreon if you choose to to help support the channel so i can continue to uh, upgrade tech and get better at that uh, i still plan on doing some more traveling to different areas and so forth and 99% um, of this comes out of my own pocket so especially actually now it's 100% out of my own pocket for all the effort and time that I put into the show so I appreciate you subscribing and anything you'd like to do on Patreon would be uh, would be thankful so that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution show thank you very much for watching everybody stay safe and until next time goodbye take care